I know there are a lot of people who feel like they need more information about what we're talking about here today. But in fact, there is a lot of information and some of it's quite dense. So what I want to try and cover off in the time that I have is touching on some of the key issues that I know are top of mind for people, both supporters and those who are still not sure. So the legislation that we're talking about today is the bill, it's a bill that has to be passed so that we can hold the referendum to amend the constitution to, in order to recognise First Peoples of Australia by establishing an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. So that's the big picture stuff. And now once this bill is passed by an absolute majority of the House of Representatives and an absolute majority of the Senate, a referendum will be held in the second half of the year, sometime we're expecting between October and December. So there are really two key things that the referendum is going to seek to do. It's going to uh, enshrine a, a, an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the constitution in the first way. It's about just recognising that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples were here when colonial settlers arrived. They were here with their 65,000 years of history, with continuous connection to the lands on which we now reside. So it's recognition. Now, I have to say, uh, Deputy Speaker, I found very few people who are opposed to that. The majority of people nod and say, well, that's just obvious, isn't it? The second part of it is about listening, listening to the voices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples when it comes to the laws and policies that affect them. And the listening part is really what I want to focus on. Now, we know that listening to communities leads to better laws and policies. I know that in my community, when we're listened to about with our local knowledge, with our understanding of the precious lands that we occupy within the Blue Mountains World Heritage Area, we know when we're listened to, the policies that affect us are much more effective. So this is about listening to communities and making a practical difference on the ground in areas that are so profound, like health, like education, uh, ha like housing. Now, that is what The Voice will help deliver. Now, why are we so confident about that? Because we know, all of us know, that when we partner with the community affected, we get a better result. And this is about partnering with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Uh, I spent 20 years of my working life going to and from the Northern Territory. Every month I was there for about a week working with very well-meaning organisations and government departments. And over the course of that 20 years, I saw the same ideas and programs being put up. You know, there might be five, ten years between them, but they came back. And they didn't achieve often what they were designed to achieve because they weren't done in partnership with communities. But where they were done in partnership communities, gee, we got some good results. And let's think of a few of them. The Indigenous Ranger Program, a really key and transformative program. Uh, the many Aboriginal community-controlled health organisations, they're making a genuine difference in their communities. Justice reinvestment, another one that changes the, the way we deal with people who are operating outside the law. These all demonstrate strong and improved outcomes when communities are involved in the decision making. And this referendum is the best chance we have to address the injustices of the past and create change that will lead to a better future and, quite frankly, lead to us in this parliament making better decisions about where taxpayer dollars go to improve the lives of the most, some of the most vulnerable population. So we'll get to the actual referendum question. Australians are going to be asked a really simple question. The question will be, and this is what will be on the ballot paper, uh, a proposed law to alter the constitution to recognise the First Peoples of Australia by establishing an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. Do you approve this proposed alteration. So that's all people will have to read on the day. That will be on the paper that, where they have to say yes or no. Now, what sits behind that is some extra words. 
and that is about the chapter that we'll put in our constitution. Um, it'll be chapter nine, and it will be called Recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Peoples, uh, and it'll have 129 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. It will say, in recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples of Australia, number one, there shall be a body to be called the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. Number two, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice may make representations to the parliament and the executive government of the Commonwealth on matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Number three, the parliament shall, subject to the constitution, have power to make laws with respect to matters relating to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice, including its composition, functions, powers and procedures. And that's it. The amendment is that simple. Now, I want to address the furphy, really, that it's the kindest way to describe it, that there's not detail and that this process has been rushed. And I think it's really important because we understand that in people's really busy everyday lives, constitutional reform is not always the highest priority. And it's not always something that I certainly know when I was busy raising kids, running a business, the last thing I would have had time to really think about is the detail of constitutional reform. Um, but it is hard to find a, a pre-referendum process since Federation, since we first wrote the Constitution, that has re can really compare to the lengthy process that we've gone through to get to this point. Uh, in fact, it's, it's a statement of fact that no referendum has been preceded by more debate, more engagement by parliamentarians, legal experts and community members than this one. There was, for instance, a, an expert panel on the recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the Constitution established in 2010, 13 years ago, and it conducted community consultation and produced a report in 2012. Then there was the 2015 report of the Joint Select Parliamentary Committee on Constitutional Recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Peoples. Now, I'm surprised that that one didn't become everybody's bedtime reading, but back then we were going into the detail of it. There was the First Nations Constitutional Dialogues conducted by the Referendum Council in 2016 and 2017 to discuss options for constitutional reform led by Aboriginal peoples. And then there was the, first, uh, the National First Nations Constitutional Convention at Uluru, held by the Referendum Council in 2017 to ratify the decision-making of the Constitutional Dialogues. And that led to the final report of the Referendum Council in June 2017, endorsing the Uluru Statement from the Heart and calling for voice, treaty and truth. So that's what got us to what, what I think people are familiar with, the Uluru Statement from the Heart. And since then, there's been the 2018 report of the Joint Select Committee on Constitutional Recognition Relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Peoples, and that recommended the government initiate the process of co-design of the voice with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Then there was the co-design interim report in 2020 and the final report in 2021, and the Prime Minister announced a draft constitutional amendment in July last year. Now, there's, since then, there's been uh, robust scrutiny and testing from various groups around it. Most recently, there was another parliamentary inquiry process. And, and uh, we've also had the Joint Select Committee on the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Voice referendum complete the most recent inquiry on the 12th of May this year. It made a single recommendation that this bill be passed without amendment. And that is exactly what this parliament should do. So that, that's an overview of where, how we find ourselves here. Um, on top of that, there's the Solicitor General's advice, which was released, that found the, it, it really, the opinion draws a line under some very wrong and baseless arguments that have been put forward, uh, including by the Leader of the Opposition, I'm afraid. Uh, and the Solicitor General's opinion is consistent with the overwhelming consensus of opinion from constitutional experts. 
The view is that not only is this amendment compatible with Australia's system of representative and responsible government, it would enhance that system. Uh, and the Solicitor General also confirms that it will be a matter for the Parliament and not the High Court to determine when and how the executive government consults the voice and considers the advice of the voice. Uh, so, so, Deputy Speaker, all of that should give Australians confidence that constitutional recognition has been well thought through and that it will work. I want to touch on the design principles that underpin it because, again, this is where, where people haven't necessarily had the opportunity to go through the detail. The detail exists. It's just finding the time to work your way through it. So the uh, design principles that have been co-designed are that things like the voice will make representations to the parliament and the executive government on matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, which means they can make, make uh, representations proactively. They can respond to requests and that the voice will have its own resources to allow, allow it to research, develop and make representations. The second design principle is that the voice will be chosen by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people based on the wishes of local communities. And this means that members are selected by their communities, not appointed by the government. Uh, members would serve on The Voice for a fixed period of time to ensure regular accountability to their communities. And to ensure cultural legitimacy, the way that members of The Voice are chosen would suit the wishes of local communities and would be determined through the post-referendum process. So that's really, they, I know people have asked questions about that, including members of my local Darug and Gundungara and Darkenjung communities. Design principle three is to ensure that, there's, that the voice is representative of Ab Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, that it is gender balanced and that it includes youth. The fourth principle is that the voice will be empowering community-led, inclusive, respectful and culturally informed. And the fifth and final, oh, well, actually there's a few more principles, but a really key one, the voice, principle number five, the voice will be accountable and transparent. Design principle six is that it works alongside existing organisations and traditional structures. So it does respect the work of existing organisations. Design seven is that it will not deliver programs. It will make re representations about improving programs, but it will not be the deliverer of those. And the final principle is that it will not have veto power. So, so there, under each of those is a whole lot more detail, and I'm really happy to share that with people in my community who, who may have more questions and now go, OK, I get that. I want to go a layer deeper. <clears throat> now, the... The, these sorts of principles were talked about in Springwood at the Hub recently when I brought together around 700 people and uh, filmmaker uh, and incredible activist Rachel Perkins shared with us her insights, her thoughts and her journey uh, through the Uluru Statement from the Heart to the, her support for the referendum. Uh, and I want to thank Rachel. Uh, she, we had 400 people in the room and we had another 300 online who were participating by entering questions, by giving responses. Now, it wasn't an exhaustive discussion. It was an initial discussion and there were a range of views canvassed, including from First Nations peoples. But it was really important to start that conversation in the community on that scale. Uh, which, which can be a daunting prospect, but I encourage all members of parliament to do it. I think uh, we'll have many more of those discussions in coming months. Uh, Deputy Speaker, the, when we think about why now, our, our First Nations caucus members, um, particularly including the Minister for Indigenous Australians, Senator Pat Dodson and Senator Malandiri McCarthy, but every one of our uh, First Nations uh, caucus members has worked very hard on this and the message really is that it's time and I want to leave 
with the words of Daniel Morrison, who is the CEO of the Wanjining Aboriginal Corporation. And he talked about why this matters for future generations. And he says, the time is now. It's 2023. We deserve change, if not for us, for the children who won't have the opportunity to vote in this year's referendum. I commend this bill to the House.